will you describe the most effective way to determine if someone has cerebral hypoperfusion? Is it important to resolve this before treating a head injury or is it more important when compression is above the heart? I'm not sure what that last part means, but hypoperfusion is just a way of saying, let's define it first. So it's where we're seeing evidence that cerebral blood flow velocity is typically how we look at it. And that's using trans, using transcranial Doppler ultrasound. You might use to use other tools to describe it. Um, Spect imaging has been used in the past as a way to do it. One thing that's harder about using uh, imaging techniques is usually you have to be laying down to do them. And for a lot of people, it's not the laying down part that's hard. It's the standing up part that's hard. Um, so if that's true, the Doppler becomes really useful. We look at that cerebral blood flow velocity as a way to understand the difference or the delta between what happens when we're laying down and we're upright. And then we can see where that perfusion is changing into the system. So the question of is hypoperfusion, like how you test for it, as far as being able to test it in a dynamic way where we can compare the difference between laying down and standing up, we can compare the difference between different types of head movements, different types of arm position, and we can be able to see what changes it and look at it as a dynamic measurement. So that is my kind of like favorite way to do it. It's a low cost, um, portable, accessible way to do that. Um... <laughs> Ginny says the last part of that question was my mistyping. <laughs> Sorry, Denise. Um, yeah, so... Uh, is it important to address that before addressing head injury? So that's a good question because it's hard to separate them. If you think about trying to heal a head injury, like we just talked about with these the stroke paper, right? They're saying that in order to heal, we have to be able to do two things. We have to be able to stimulate the neuron. And then we also have to be able to get fuel to the neuron, which is going to be oxygen and glucose largely. So if we're having hypoperfusion, not getting enough blood flow in, it's really hard to get enough oxygen and glucose to that cell to be able to help it get stronger when we stimulate it. Otherwise, we stimulate it and it doesn't have any way to fuel itself and then it becomes problematic. So I, I wouldn't separate them. I would say that treating the head injury while also understanding with the perfusion is like a superpower because it lets you say, I want to be able to stimulate that brain to be able to heal it at the rate that matches the glucose and oxygen delivery to it. And if I can do that, then it allows me to build strength and momentum within that system so that we can that we can keep it going up and up and up. So I would look at them as a team and say, if I can understand them both together and work at them together, then that allows me to be able to be more specific in terms of the stimulus that you're using. And then also more specific in terms of the dose. So it allows you to pick the right thing to target and then the right amount of effort to put into that or the right amount of stimulus to use. So that's a great question. Um, well done. Even with a typo, even with a typo, we nailed it. So great job. Um, Professor MJ. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Let me get a drink of water real quick. Uh, is there anything anyone can do at home to calm or balance their vestibular system? So I would say two parts to this question. Number one, that's a tough one because your vestibular system is multi-parts. You've got a peripheral system. You've got a central system. The central system is also going to integrate inputs from your eyes and your proprioceptors, right? So it, it becomes this diffuse network. Number two, when we say calm, I think I think I understand what that means of the feeling that we have the movement. But also, we have kind of two different directions that the vestibular system can run. Sometimes we can have it malfunction to where it is hyperactive. We are feeling gravity. We are feeling movement that is not there. And that's problematic. And in that sense, you probably would want to feel like you'd want it to calm down. In those instances, that may be because something is actually overfiring or it may be because the thing that should be countermanding or opposing it is not firing enough. So the normal signal feels like too much. The second piece of that is like things you can do to balance it at home would be specific to where that problem is. If it's in the periphery, you're going to solve that a certain way by being able to stimulate the peripheral receptor. 
if it's in the central system, same thing. This is often the basis of vestibular rehab where we kind of generalize it and they say like do these things called cawthorn Cooksey exercises, which is, you know, shaking your head back and forth and up and down and, you know, watching your thumb go opposite. But normally when we watch people do these, it's way beyond the scale of what they should do with their particular problem. Um, and what we actually want to do is be more specific. So if we're looking for the general kind of like try to hammer it ways, what you would typically go, th go through a vestibular rehab is going to be suitable. Um, and what they're doing is is a series of vestibular rehab drills that are considered there. They come from Cawthorn Cooksey. Uh, it's an older model where they would kind of walk through this progression and just have everybody do that. It helps that it would kind of recalibrate the vestibular system. Works for some people. Can you explain dissociation versus seizures? What do they feel like or how might one know which they are experiencing or where to go? So dissociation is a is a feeling, right? So I can't look at someone and say, you know what, you're dissociated right now. You might be able to describe a feeling that you have and I might infer that that's what you're experiencing, right? But a dissociation classically is going to be what someone will experience when they don't feel like they are connected to themselves. When they don't feel a part of their body, they may not feel might feel like my head is floating or I'm not inside my brain or it's hard to be able to to connect to myself. And in these cases, a lot of what we tend to look at is how we're able to deliver fuel to the area and then how that is then going to influence the functioning. So we may see that it's not just fuel related. It could be related to an injury or trauma within the system that causes malfunction within that, that functional connection where, where we see the brain isn't able to generate that sense of self that we experience. There's this really good book. I don't know if you guys have read it or not. Um, oh, now it's going to escape me as soon as I think of it. It's sitting in our office right now. Oh, what's her name? I can't think of it. But she she was a neuroscientist. It's going to come to me. It, I said it a thousand times. But she's a neuroscientist and she had a stroke. And she was able to feel as a portion of that stroke where she felt like she just kind of like dissolved into the world and became lost like the borders of herself. Um, and as a consequence of that, it gives us an insight into understanding like as these areas of our brain work and perceive our body, they allow us to be able to define the borders of this body versus the the world at large. So we can find that when we affect those areas, particularly in the parietal lobe, um, that we see these kind of changes in our sense of self. And dissociation can be a part of that, whether it's from the injury that is more uh, chronic duration or something that happens acutely or something that may come and go due to ischemic changes. And that's probably what a lot of people feel is where it's kind of coming and going based on how much we're stressing or taxing that system for, for a person.